Lord, you're so good and you're so faithful to us. And Lord, we thank you for your written word that you have given us. Thank you that each part of it is valuable for our instruction, our growth. Lord, that you're able to use it by your spirit to mold us and shape us more into the image of Jesus. And God, we ask that as we cover a couple chapters this evening, that, Lord, that you would bring that application to our lives. And we pray for those that can't be with us this evening for one reason or another and ask for your blessings upon those uh, that are away and... Um, for those that are even out of the country, Lord, and we, we pray that you would uh, bless their travels as they return. And uh, we just thank you for this time. Help me, Lord, to communicate well. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so just um, kind of recapping a few things is that the, the rebuilding of the walls has been finished. Uh, the city has been made secure, and the rebuilding of the people has started, uh, the rebuilding of the people by the word of God. And we saw the, the people uh, repenting of their sin, of having intermarried with pagan peoples. Um, they separated from them, and then they confirmed by covenant that they would seek to keep God's law. Unfortunately, I mean like anyone, uh, they're going to fail because they, they committed to fulfilling the whole of the law. Um, they're going to fail. We're going to see that next time. Uh, a reminder to us that, that the keeping of the law is an impossibility for us. We need Jesus. We need grace. We need to be clothed in Jesus' righteousness before God. We need the Holy Spirit to uh, empower us to live uh, the Christian life and to pick us up when we fail. Um, it's been some time since we talked about the enemies of God's people and plan, and we just have to you know, ask the question, well, have they given up? And the answer is no. <laughs> they, were, they were regrouping they were scheming new plans to try to impede or even take over the work that has been done so far. What have they been doing? Well, we were told back in chapter 6, Nehemiah wrote, Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tob Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and the son of Jehohan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Bechariah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. And so they weren't done. There was intrigue behind the scenes that hasn't been talked about for a few chapters. Surely the, the letters continued to go back and forth between Tobiah and his allies that he was allied to by oath. Plans were being made. Plots were being imagined. And they took the opportunity whenever they could to paint Tobiah uh, and his compatriots in a good light to Nehemiah. While at the same time, if they were able to, if they were near Nehemiah, trying to gain any useful information that they had about Nehemiah to give to Tobiah and his allies. And so even though we haven't heard mention of the enemies of the work of God there, we should know that they had not given up. They were merely plotting and waiting for the opportune time to strike. Walter Adnay wrote this, Sanballat and his associates saw clearly enough that if Jerusalem were to become strong again, 
the metropolitan preeminence which had shifted from this city to Samaria after the Babylonian conquest would revert to its old seat among the hills of Judah and Benjamin, meaning Jerusalem. And so Sambalat was a Samaritan and he did not want Samaria becoming less important. It had gained importance while Israel lied or Jerusalem lied in ruins. And so he was plotting. You have Tobiah plotting. You have Sambalat plotting. You have Geshem the Arab plotting. Likewise, when all seems quiet and at peace, we can know that our enemy has not given up trying to impede or even stop the work of God that he's doing in and through our lives. We, maybe we've been building for God, and the enemy is merely plotting to strike at a more opportune time. You may recall that when the, the devil had finished in his temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, that it says in Luke, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So the devil wasn't finished. He was going to try to strike when it was more advantageous for him, when he suspected Jesus of being weak. And so there's this uh, scripture that's come up a lot recently that, that we need to, as Peter exhorts us, to be sober-minded, to be watchful. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's looking for that opportune time to strike. Well, Nehemiah knows full well that his enemies were not completely defeated. And so he's going to take further measures to guard against the plotting. Further measures that needed to be put in place, both for the protection of Jerusalem, but also that it would be restored to its rightful place as the, the center of the region and for the glory of God. There had been a problem, and there still was a problem, that although the walls and the temple were fully rebuilt, the city itself was not. We were told back in chapter 7, the city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. So G Jerusalem needed a substantial population in order to guard it and to restore it to its, its prominence of being the, the economic and, more importantly, the religious center for Israel. A place where you know, God desired it to be a light to the Gentiles, to shine out as a beacon of truth to the world proclaiming the one true God. A light that was supposed to draw all nations to Him. That was part of God's plan of redemption. Firmly establishing the Jews back in Jerusalem was preparation for the fulfillment of prophecy concerning Jesus. The Messiah needed a city to enter and be triumphantly received, then to be rejected and crucified outside of its walls. And that city needed to be Jerusalem. Now the spiritual enemy of God's people and plans was at work among the physical enemies of Nehemiah and the others trying to derail the promises of God and his plan of redemption. And this is true in our day. That is the reason why there's so much conflict over the city of Jerusalem now. I mean, we, there was events last night, right? Rockets in the air. Um, which are going to increase 
on into the future. Our spiritual enemy is continually trying to overthrow the plans and purposes of God. He thinks, well, maybe I can keep Jesus from coming back. Well, he's going to fail. <laughs> because what God has spoken will come to pass. The Lord said, through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 46, 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. <clears throat> and that's very comforting, at least it should be for us, that God's promises to us will not fail. His words to us are going to come to pass. The work that he has begun in you, he's going to finish. The work that he desires to do through you, he will do as you yield unto him. He will do so. Well, <clears throat> the word you see in your notes there, sorry if you don't have the notes, but is impact. And I'm sure that Nehemiah, he knew that the task at hand was of great importance. He knew that God had brought him to rebuild Jerusalem. He knew the importance of Jerusalem being restored. He knew the importance of the people being restored. But he probably didn't know the scale of the impact of his decisions and his commitment to fulfill the work of God. So much so that his impact is, I mean, tonight, here in Paphos, we're talking about Nehemiah. Because the record of what he did in God's word. Still having impact. And so there's a ministry principle here for us, is that our, our building for God, our faithfulness to live for him, often, if not always, is far more impactful than we realize. Therefore, we're to continue to be faithful, knowing that God will be faithful to use it. And this is where I wish I had better wording, but that's where it is. To be faithful to use it to impact those he desires. He's going to use it the way that he desires to. Several years ago now, I returned to Hungary where I had been a missionary several years before that. I hadn't been there for a long time. And on three separate occasions, people said to me, people that I had ministered among, they said to me, you know, the sentences started something like this, Lauren, do you remember when you did this? And I, I, I had, oh no, what did I do? Oh Lord, what, what? And thankfully, they were all good things. Um, God's grace, you know? And you know, one, one lady was like, Lauren, do you remember when you, you pulled me aside and you rebuked me? You had a word with me. And I'm, I, I did not remember that at all. And, but she was like, that was so important that you did that. It changed my life. And I, I took the heed and went the direction that you told me to go. Another was, uh, she was now the pastor's wife. At the time, she was just a little girl in the church. And I had given her a little, a little toy. And she's like, Lauren, do you remember when you gave me this toy? And partly it's because I have such a terrible memory, but I'm like, no, I don't. I don't remember. And she goes, that, that toy was such a special gift and a treasure for me. So encouraging for me. Thank you for giving that to me. And, you know, it's just like little things that we may do in our walk with Jesus that ha can have great impact upon people for good. Yeah, there's the converse. They can be bad too, but that not if we're doing it for Jesus, but, um, you know, 
doing things for good. Realize that, you know, you might feel like, oh, I'm just doing a little thing. Well, it may not be that little. It probably isn't. It's probably much greater than you think. Okay, so the beginning of chapter 11 is, is talking about the repopulating of Jerusalem. I'm going to read the first two verses here. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. Okay. So it appears that the majority of the leaders already lived in Jerusalem. But in order to get the population back up, 10% of the population were chosen by lot to relocate to Jerusalem. The rest of the people lived outside the city. Why not live in Jerusalem? Why wouldn't you want to be there? Well, most people didn't want to be there. Why? Because it was uncomfortable. They were comfortable where they were living now. And it takes, you know, I've had to move several times, and it takes effort to move. And to, if you, especially if, if you need to rebuild a house or build a house, that's even more effort. And it takes faith to believe that, you know, God's going to make sure everything works out. And so that, that can be uncomfortable. And so for a lot of people, that was too uncomfortable. They did not want to do that. Others were afraid. Why? Because Jerusalem was still at the center, <laughs> like it is today, at the tensions between the Jews and their enemies. And there were those that just, you know, I want to be far from where the trouble is. I don't want to be there. That's just a fearful thing for me. They were afraid. And then others were just distracted. They didn't see the importance of rebuilding the city, really. They were focused on other things, whatever those other things were. Those other things seemed more important than the repopulating and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So there were many that didn't want to live in Jerusalem. But there's this, this blessing here. Why? Because some willingly volunteered to live in the city, whom the people responded with, Wow, you're going to live in the city? Blessings upon you for doing so. Why did they bless them? Because they had volunteered to do so rather than being told to do so. And the people recognized that person's making a choice that I'm uncomfortable with, but I'm... impressed by what they're doing. I want to honor them for taking that step. Well, how can we apply this today? Well, there are believers who have opportunity to step out in faith for God, but they don't want to. Why? It's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's uncomfortable to step out of our comfort zones. That's why they're called comfort zones. It's our zone of comfort. To step out in faith for God. Many won't take those steps because it's, it's beyond what they're comfortable with. It's like, oh no, I, I'd, never, I, I'd never do that. When I first became a Christian, I got saved while I was uh, attending university. And... Um, I didn't get saved at the university. 
but then I, I began to, to rub shoulders with some of the university students that were Christians. And I got invited to uh, this, this gathering of uh, Christian students because I, I wasn't involved with any of the ministries on campus. And I remember you know, talking to these different people and they were like talking about the future and they asked me, you know, well, what's your major? And my major was history. And first they were like, what's the point of that? Um, because they, they were like engineers and architects and they, that's what they were doing. And that was their, that's what they were thinking. They were like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be an architect. And like, what are you going to do with history? That was the, that was the question at the time. And I said, well, you know, I was planning on becoming a professor. That was my goal. But now, you know, I've only been a Christian for a short time. Now I'm thinking about being a missionary. And they were like, oh, I would never do that. That's crazy. Like, you're, you're crazy. Like, why would you do that? I mean... Places where missionaries go, they're dangerous, and you know they just kind of rolled out the list, and it just blew my mind because here I've just recently embraced Jesus as my Savior, and I'm like, why wouldn't I do anything for Jesus if it's dangerous or not? Let's do it. And here I'm, I'm being introduced to these people that have been Christians for a long time, and they're like, you're crazy. Why would you do that? Why, why, why wouldn't you just remain? comfortable and pursue the American dream, whatever that means, yeah? So that many will not take those steps of faith because it's uncomfortable for them, or they're, once again, they're afraid. They're, they're afraid of the unknown because to take steps of faith, there's an unknown element. It takes faith and trust in God, and they think something bad might happen. Something bad might happen. But if God is calling us to do it, will he not compensate for that bad? He will. And don't we have the promise that he can work all things together for our eternal good? Yes, we do. Others are just distracted. And like some of these guys that I was speaking with that evening many, many years ago, they were just distracted. They were like, well, you know what? For me, I, I've, got my, I've got my plan. I'm going to graduate with my engineering degree, and then I'm going you know, to work for this firm, and then I'm going to you know, progress, and then I'm going to have my own firm, and then it's just, you know, it's just going to, that's how it's going to go. And it, there's no like, thought of like, well, actually, there's like millions of people that have never heard about Jesus before. So, what's the priority? What, what, where are we at? And I'm not saying that, you know, some, so I've got a good friend who's an engineer in California who he started supporting me as supporting me to be a missionary while he was an engineering student. So out of his student poverty, he started supporting me as a missionary because he was like, you know what? I'm not called to go, but you're called to go. But I can support you to do what God is calling you to do, and I can serve God here. And almost 30 years later, he's still supporting me, and he's a great friend. He, but he's got it right. He's not distracted. Many people, they are distracted. They've got more important things going on, which, you know, when you think about, okay, this is what God is doing. This is what God wants you to do. Oh, no, this is more important. This is what I want to do. It's like, no, it's God. <laughs> Isn't what he wants to do more important? But we, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I don't get distracted. I do. You know, and it could be a combination of, a three, uh, of all three why people don't step out in faith or don't want to be uncomfortable. They're afraid and they're also distracted. Anyway, there's blessing. There is blessing that comes to those who will come forward and say yes to God's call to step out. Here I am. 
send me. There may be hardship. It will be uncomfortable. I can guarantee that. It will be uncomfortable. Maybe even fearful. But blessing comes on our way for being obedient to the Lord. And I'm not speaking of, you know, that blessing is however God wants to bring the blessing. It's not necessarily material blessing. It may not even be blessing that we experience in the here and now, but you know what? We've got an eternity to look forward to. And we're told that we're going to be rewarded for those things that stand God's test at the Bema Seat of Christ. And we're going to be rewarded for those. What does that mean? I don't know exactly, but I know that if God gives it to me, it's going to be good. Yeah. Blessing. And also, too, we can serve maybe as an inspiration. That's one of those blessings. We may just be an inspiration and an encouragement for others in their faith, like Timothy. We might be an encouragement to him. How you doing? Good. You made it. What, um, what, what page are we on so we can tell Timothy where, where we're at? Four? I'm going quick, huh? So we can be an encouragement to others for encouraging them in their faith as we're taking steps of faith. Like the people that stepped out here and said, you know, I'll, I'll go to Jerusalem. And the others were like, wow, blessings upon you. Um, Warren Wiersbe, he wrote this. Never underestimate the importance of simply being physically present in the place where God wants you. You may not be asked to perform some dramatic ministry, but simply being there is a ministry. The men, women, and children who helped to populate the city of Jerusalem were serving God, their nation, and future generations by their step of faith. Going back to ministry in Hungary in the uh, late 90s. There was two families that would come on a Sunday morning. And uh, they were complete family units, uh, husband and wife and children. And they came and they, um, they sat in the back. And inevitably... Mm, Within 15, maybe 30 minutes, both the men, they were out, totally out. Why? Because both those men were miners who worked in the pits, in the mines. Yeah? And what had they done? They had worked all day into the night. They had come out of the pit had gone home, got washed up, got their families together, and took them to church. Did we give them a hard time about falling asleep? No way. But they were making a statement, weren't they? That gathering together as believers is very important to worship God together. And they were making a great example for their children because they're like, we're going. You say you're tired? <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> yep. And so they were just there. They, there was no, you know, ministry happening in the sense of them doing anything other than being present and being asleep. Yeah. But that ministry was powerful. A great witness to everyone else and to their children. And... Uh, Year, moving years forward, when, when uh, my wife and I, we were church planting in the UK, and for many of those years, we were alone. Um, people would come maybe for the weekend to help us. And we had one girl that um, was, she was working full time and leading worship. Um, and we just, we felt alone much of that time. And then we had 
another couple, a young couple, join us. And they were with us for, I don't know, three and a half years or something. And just them arriving and being with us, there was almost like just a, a tangible, like we could feel, like, oh, the load is lighter and the light is brighter just because they, had, they were there, they were present. And so God can do much through our lives, just being present, yeah? Okay, now it describes the people in Jerusalem from verse 3 to verse 24. Am I going to read that whole thing? No. Because you don't want to hear me struggle over the names, okay? Although I did teach this class at Bible college with Israeli students, and they, I worked very hard at my pronunciation, and they said that I did very well. So maybe they were just being gracious. But I do have a book that tells me how to pronounce the names, so that helps. But we're not going to do that tonight. We're not at Bible college. It's, it's all okay. So I'll just give you an overview. And that is there were leaders, Levites, temple servants, and Solomon servants there. And then it kind of breaks it down Descendants of Judah, descendants of Benjamin, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the temple servant overseers, and the Levite overseer. So you've got these guys that are um, overseeing the, the servants. Those are overseeing the Levites. And we do have some, some notable people there. We have some men that are called valiant Men, V-A-L-I-A-N-T, valiant. We're told that the sons of Perez were valiant men. And that word could be interpreted, uh, translated in a variety of ways. Men of, it can mean men of substance or outstanding men. It was also applied to men who were strong and brave. But it's speaking of, of at least men of character. Yeah? Now, interestingly, just a few verses away, you have men of valor, V-A-L. Should we be American or British? Um, we'll be British, O-U-R, V-A-L-O-U-R. And this was normally used in the sense of military might. So this, is, this word was more like, okay, you're strong men of valor. Why would you want valiant men and men of valor in Jerusalem? Wow, because they're good guys to have around. Protecting the city, being examples for others, just good men to have in the city. Yeah? Good men to have around in the church. Valiant men. Those who are valiant in their commitment to Jesus, the word of God. Men of valor, men that are honorable, that we can trust. Of course, we need ladies that are the same. Yeah. Okay, we have this, this Levite called Pethahiah, and he was a liaison to the king. So he's giving reports to the king. It says there, in all manners concerning the people. So he was just informing the king how things were going, what's going on. And then we have Hasanua. He's called the second over the city. Well, back in chapter 7, we already had um, Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, put in charge over Jerusalem. Okay, So Hasanua is second over the city. Under who? I don't know. Um, but they were probably dividing up the work looking after the city. Um, Ahitab is, he's the ruler over the temple, the actual temple itself. And then Shabbatiah and Jehozabad, they were rulers over the outside of the temple. So you have all this structure that is being put in place. Yeah. 
So the walls, the gates, the temple, and the compound, the city itself were being made secure as these men were placed in various capacities. And the temple was especially important to guard against defilement and protected by those who would come and steal its treasures. (laughs) Guarding it. So if you, you know, if you're praying for the church, which I encourage you to do so, pray that the Lord would raise up valiant people within the fellowship. Those that can stand guard and also be an encouragement and example to others. And you know, when I say the church, I'm talking, we have, we have those that meet here on Sunday morning. We have the Vietnamese church. You have the Chinese church, yeah? And so there's a a vast array of what the Lord is doing. Okay, verses 11, uh, not not 11, because we're in chapter 11, verse 25, (laughs) through 36, that's letting us know about the people outside of Jerusalem. And the only people that kind of get any special kind of recognition there is in verse... um, 35, Lod and Ono, the valley of craftsmen. So here we learn that Ono was a valley for the, where the craftsmen were. And that's the place where Sambalit and Geshem had tried to get Nehemiah to come to. Not necessarily to Ono itself, but it, the plains of Ono. All right. Now we move into chapter 12. In chapter 12, uh, there's this list of the priests and the Levites. And that goes to uh, 1 to 16. Which, that's not right. That's a typo. It's 26. So... 1 to 26. And in this list that I, once again, I'm not going to read to you, um, there's some notable people. Abijah, he's in verse 4. He's an ancestor of John the Baptist. Then in verse 10, we have Eliashib, who's the acting high priest. He's in verse 10. But we'll see in chapter 13 that he's living a compromised life. So he's not a good example. And then in verse... I didn't put it in there, did I? 22. You have Jadua. And we're not exactly sure, but Jadua is, is probably the father or the grandfather of the high priest with the same name. And this high priest, if you, if you see the painting there, He came out with his high priestly robes and everything to meet Alexander the Great. As Alexander the Great was moving east, conquering, and he's headed to Jerusalem, Jadua came out and met Alexander, and Alexander was so impressed with this Jadua, that he listened to him, and this Jadua told him, told Alexander, that his coming had been prophesied by Daniel the prophet, 
which caused Alexander to not destroy Jerusalem and its temple, but actually to go into the temple and to uh, worship in there. So that, that Jadua had a huge influence. <laughs> he saved Jerusalem from destruction. And we don't have this in the biblical record. It's not in the biblical record. This is recorded for us uh, in the Jewish historian jo- Josephus' accounts. Okay, that brings us to time for a break already. That's what it brings us to. Let's take a break now. All right. Um, now we have the record of the celebration of the dedication of the walls as they uh, dedicate the walls unto the Lord. So, verse 27 of chapter 12. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the district surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the, okay, Metophathelites, Metophathelites, also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba and Asmath, Mav, Mav. for the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites purified themselves and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Okay, so. Uh, all the Levites, the, pre- the priests, gathered with the people to dedicate the walls. And the Levites and the priests, they purified themselves and the people, the gates, the wall, by sprinkling the blood of sacrificial animals, most likely. And all of this as a, a sign of them being set apart to the Lord as His. And the city being set apart to the Lord as his, dedicating the walls unto him. And from this, there was a procession that took place. Verse 31. Then I, and um, this is Nehemiah again, he's back. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs and gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate, and after them went Hosiah and half of the leaders of Judah and Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priest's sons with trumpets. Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zechur, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Azrael, Mil. Mil, Mil, Eli, Giliah, Mai, uh, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra, the scribe, went before them. At the fountain gate, they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David, at the ascent of the wall of the house of David, to the water gate on the east. The other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half of the people on the wall above the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, and above the gate of Ephraim, and by the gate of Yeshana, and by the fish gate, and the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred to the sheep gate, and they came to a halt at the gate of the guard. Okay, so there's two groups of leaders with choirs who most likely met at the valley gate. And Ezra led one clockwise toward the gate of the guard in the temple compound. And then Jezariah or another Levite led the other group anti-clockwise 
to the same gate. And Nehemiah followed behind, he says. And so here we see the distinction between their roles. Ezra was a scribe and a priest, right? So he's, he's leading his group. Nehemiah, he's a governor. He's following the other group, okay? And they praise as they made their way around. Uh, the choir was singing. The musicians are playing praise to God. And then in verse 43, it says, And they offered great sacrifices that day, and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. And so once they met at the temple, many sacrifices were offered. Everyone rejoiced at God, you know, with a God-given joy, so much so that their rejoicing is heard outside of Jerusalem, a long way off. And, you know, they indeed had a lot to be joyful over. God had been so faithful to them. And God, I mean, he's so worthy of our worship. He is indeed faithful. And if you think about that picture of those two, you know, I'm sure large groups of choirs making their way around the city walls and they're singing and there's rejoicing and there's people there in the city and they're rejoicing. Re remember these words from Nehemiah 4? Geshem. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria. Or maybe that, was that Sambalat or Geshem? Let me look. Sambalat. And he, so Sambalat said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Wow, what about now? You got two large groups on that wall praising God and they're offering sacrifices unto the Lord. Yes. So their enemies' taunts and their threats had come to nothing. God had equipped the people to overcome. And you know what? Their own discouragements had also been overcome as Nehemiah continued to point them to the Lord and prayed, encouraging them to trust in the Lord. Remember, also in chapter 4, verse 10, in Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And then in chapter 5, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. Hmm. God had been faithful. He gave them the strength that they needed. He corrected what was wrong between them as the, remember the nobles had been taking advantage of the people and that got that got corrected, and so God equipped them to finish the wall. And you can imagine as some of those guys, as they, they're walking on the walls, and then other people, they're looking at the walls, and as they looked, certain stones, they remembered those stones. Oh yeah, I remember that one. That one was heavy. That was a burden, yeah? Stones they personally struggled with, but now those stones are firmly fixed in the wall. God's faithfulness. And this celebration was also 
uh, a celebration with expectancy. Because as they've dedicated the walls, there's this ex- sense of expectancy because God had a plan. There was hope for the future as God had a plan for them and the city of Jerusalem. And for us, it's the same. We too, we can look back at God's faithfulness. Yeah, We can remember some of those stones, those circumstances that were like, oh, that was, that was rough. But God, he gave me the strength to pick that up in a sense and to move on. Yeah, We can look back and worship him for what he's done. And because he is faithful, we connect that to the fact that he's got a plan. In him, we have hope. In him, our future is bright. We can look forward to what is ahead. Like Abraham, whom it was written, for he was looking forward to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. God has good things in store. Yeah. In the foundations class, we're going to be considering, we looked at the signs of the times leading up to Jesus' return. And the signs are not nice. <laughs> And then we looked at the tribulation period, and ooh, that wasn't nice either. So this week, we're going to look at, okay, what about us in Christ? What do we have to look forward to? What is the millennial reign? What is that going to look like as Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years? What is heaven going to look like? Uh, The future is very bright, very bright indeed. In verses 44 through 47, there's uh, these uh, appointments that are made. On that day, men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes, to gather into them the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. And they performed the service of their God in the service of purification, as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In all Israel, in the days of Zerubbabel, in the days of Nehemiah, gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, And they set apart that which was for the Levites, and the Levites set apart that which was for the sons of Aaron. Okay, so overseers for the storerooms to uh, house the the first fruits and the tithes that were to be given to support the priests and the Levites, that was assigned. And Nehemiah recalls for us how those dedicated to the Lord's service were provided for in the past and during his time and in the time of Zerubbabel. We'll see that this area is going to be compromised under Eliashib's leadership and Nehemiah's absence. Because between this verse that we just read The last one of chapter 12 and chapter 13, there is a gap of years. Nehemiah leaves. He goes back to Babylon. Ezra also might leave and go back to Babylon. And we're going to see that things do not go well as they are gone. Okay. Now... As we've been going through, we've mentioned how Nehemiah and Ezra's dedication to the Lord had far-reaching consequences. 
impacting generations of people for the glory of God. I'm sure much more than they anticipated. Now there are, there are two names of men who had long since passed before this time, but their impact was still um, impacting the lives of those and inspiring the lives of those who were living in Nehemiah's day. Do you know what those two names are? They're repeated. David, he's the second one in our list. Who's the first one? Asaph. Asaph and David. They had passed on long, long, long time before this. But what they had done for the Lord, their service for the Lord, was still having impact in Nehemiah's day on into our day. Many of the psalms that we have are psalms of Asaph. Yeah. And of course, we have the record of David that you guys have been looking at on Tuesday nights with Pastor Tim. And so the application for us is, is be encouraged in the work that the Lord has for you. You have no idea how far into the future it will bear fruit in this life on into the next. Yeah? And I'm going to close with this example. And boy, we're, we're getting done early, early today. And that's okay. Well, this man, Richard Sibbs, and these are all English guys. Yeah. One thing about living in England for 20 years, I learned to few things about English guys, okay. Um, Richard Sibbs, he was a Puritan theologian. And I mean, look at that. He died in 1635. That's a while ago. He wrote a book called The Bruised Reed, which that was read and led to the conversion of a man called Richard Baxter. And he would become a Puritan pastor and theologian. He died in 1691. And he wrote a book called The Call to the Unconverted. You can tell this evangelistic book, right? Yeah. Well, that was read and assisted in the conversion of Philip Doddridge, who was a hymn writer and theologian. He died in 1751. And he wrote The Prog Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul. That book was read by a man called William Wilberforce, who he was a, a member of the British Parliament, and he tirelessly pushed for the abolishment of the African slave trade. And I can't remember how long it was, but it was a very long time. <laughs> I can't remember if it was one decade or two. It was a long time. Movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. One of my favorites. Yeah. He pushed and he pushed. And he also wrote a book called A Practical View of Christianity, which he was calling the British people back to faith in Jesus that, had, that, had, that really meant something, not just like, I'm a Christian because I live in Britain, that sort of thing. And that book led to many others to commit their lives to 
a living relationship with Jesus. Now, God may not call you to write a book. And that's okay. Because God has other things that he has for you. I know this, that he wants to use your life. And as you yield to him, he has great opportunity to use your life to impact others. And we never know how far that impact will go. I mean, William Wilberforce, millions of people benefited from his efforts. Millions. Little did Richard Sibbs know when he wrote his book that eventually that would lead in line to William Wilberforce. Yeah? Pretty cool. Okay. Our quiz. Lord, we thank you that you're able to take our little lives and that you're able to do much through them as we give them and yield them to you. And so, Lord, we we want to um, give our lives afresh into your hands and ask you, Lord, to do all that you want to do in and through our lives. Lord, help us to, uh, to go where you want us to go, to do what you want us to do, to say what you want us to say. Lord, that we, we wouldn't be controlled by not wanting to be uncomfortable or being afraid or being distracted. Lord, help us to be in tune with your spirit and led and directed by you. Lord, may our lives bear much fruit for your glory until your return. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.